Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to all of you for choosing our panel to come along to at Melbourne Jewish Book Week. Um, but of course, why wouldn't you? Uh, <laughs> for those of you who I've not yet met, my name is Alice Aslavsky, broadcaster, columnist and author. Uh, and I woke up on uh, Wurundjeri country this morning and here I am on Boon country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, and particularly to any First Nations people who are along uh, for the ride of this panel today. And my co-conspirators on this stage really um, require very little in the way of introduction because you would know their work. Uh, one of them is new, a newbie. I'll start with her because <laughs> Joanna Hu's book actually has not come out yet. It comes out in July, strong recommend. It's called Chinese-ish. Joanna is an illustrator as well as a lapsed front of house <laughs> hospitality yes. worker. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, beside her is Tony Tan, a chef, or owner and founder of the Trentham Cooking School uh, as well as author of Hong Kong. Food City. If you don't have that book, it truly is my favourite book on um, cooking things like, uh, what recipe do I love of Tony's? He's got these little walnut biscuits that just are just the best thing to have in the house. Um, a milchig option, if you would like. Uh, Danny Vallant <laughs> is the author of um, several uh, cookbooks uh, in, the, in the Mix series, as well as an upcoming book, which is a co- authored one with uh, a local uh, chef of a Persian background. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I don't know actually, the reason I'm kind of being a bit vague is because I don't know if Danny's announced the existence of that book yet. Alice, can, you can break the news if you want. That's you can fine. break the news. I'll, I'll hold the news for you to break. Uh, but I'm going to break the news to you. This is a hot topic. Who gets to write about food? Who gets to tell the stories of a culture and can we borrow from other cultures if, after all, isn't that the point of food? Sharing, reiterating, recreating, adding, subtracting, etc. So the reason why uh, this topic really is a hot topic is because so many more people are recognising that for so long food, the food writing space has been um, a space that uh, some people have not felt that they belong in. So I, I think that's probably a good place to start. And, um, and I think I'm going to start with a question around that idea of belonging. Because it's something that came up uh, in, in the room, in the green room before. Uh, Joanna, I know that this is your first panel ever. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to be... I think that deserves a round of applause, actually. Oh, Let's God. break some ice. Congratulations. It's a big... Thank you, you very know, much. So this thank crowd you. looks very lovely and a nice way to break me in. That's it. That's it. Um, what does it mean to you to see more diverse voices in food and in writing? Yeah, so um, I'm not primarily a food writer, as I was mentioned, um, but I do contribute to some writing in this upcoming Chinese-ish cookbook. And I think I wrote a lot about <coughs> the experience of being Chinese-ish and what it felt like to grow up in Australia, especially I immigrated in the early 90s and I definitely remember the first wave of Pauline Hansen and One Nation. That was a real treat. Um, and especially over the last few years, having been able to see more representation of Asian faces now, I've suddenly realised that maybe all along it was something that I was missing and it was like getting a hug when you didn't realise you needed one. Um, and I think a lot of people, especially from communities that weren't represented, are seeing representation now and saying how affirming that can be. Um, and especially in this world where there are spaces, there are places that are quite perhaps uh, rural or places where people who are different don't feel safe to be themselves. Being able to, or, you know, with the power of the internet, being able to find a book, find a story, find a TV show, a movie that has some representation that looks like them can be so affirming. So uh, it's something that I really like to see and I'm really proud to now be a face of in some way. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Tony, you looked at me with a devilish little grin. You have something to say. No, I, I've, I find the whole topic about belonging is a little bit strange because, well, I came here to Australia to finish university and then somehow or other I got um, 
bulldoze into um, cooking in a place called Shakahari many years ago. And so, you know, and, and then somehow other along the way, I ended up running restaurants and doing so many other th things which I find a little bit odd. But in the case of belonging, you see, I, 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 I was born in Malaysia, so I don't really quite know what I am. So in my head, I was just, there is a, well, there is a, a Malaysian expression, and it goes like this, and that is, you are a chapalang. A chapalang person means that you are actually of a mixed race, or mixed origin, or, or that you are actually not, you are actually not pure as far as, as, as I'm concerned. So I've always wondered if my mother actually had a visitor. But, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but I have to say that it's, it's a bit odd because, you see, Malaysians as a rule, you know, they, 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 we, are, they, we are like Australia in the sense that, you know, here we are on the panel, you know, all of us come from different backgrounds and so on. And so, you know, what, where do I belong to? I don't really quite know, except that I do know that I belong to a place called Trentham. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And uh, Danny Valent, you've been writing about food and about the food of this city, this um, hodgepodge of different cuisines and cultures. How have you seen that hodgepodge change over the years and decades? Uh, such an interesting question. I do feel so lucky to be writing about food in Melbourne and in Australia where um, there is always something new to discover. So there are always, I suppose, I've, you know, we've seen different waves of migration and certainly, you know, a lot of, um, you know, the, uh, Australia's Jews came here, well, at various times, but so many um, after the Second World War and that's when my father's family came here in 1949. So I suppose, the, you know, but there are all these different markers and even neighbourhood markers where you can see different cuisines that have, I guess, um, yeah, I guess recolonised Australia in different ways and, it, yeah, I think the way I've seen it change is that you've, you just, you, I think food writers have always been, there's always been these waves of going deeper. So it's like going deeper as a person, going deeper as a cook, going deeper into culture and connecting, I think, you know, perhaps when I started writing about food, there was more this sense that you could connect with a culture simply by eating some food made by people that were f from a different place. But I feel like now there's an onus on food writers to be more engaged, to be more engaged with the history and the context of the food that we're eating and to tell richer stories around it. Um, so, I mean, I really welcome that. I think a lot of traditional, you know, I. I mean, my first writing job was, was writing online, but I definitely am, I suppose, more what you'd call, you know, I write for traditional print media. I've, that's where I've sort of um, done most of my restaurant criticism. And I think it's... Um, a lot, of, a lot of print media journalists have felt threatened by the rise of the internet and bloggers and people who've, you know, been able to create a space and, and find a voice and, be, and find a platform perhaps where they weren't part of a traditional um, media space. I, I've always really welcomed that rather than felt threatened by it because I think if you're not celebrating diversity through food, like, where are you going to do it? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a place where... There's always more to learn and I think, yeah, the more voices that are out there that we can all learn from, I think that's, yeah, we're all the richer for it. And um, now I'm deciding, I'm reading the room, okay. Now, Joanna, yes. <coughs> uh, Chinese-ish is just as much about the illustration as it is about the recipes themselves and the illustration of uh, imagery, I mean, the, the evocative imagery that, that you create as well within the introductions. Yeah. Um, what was that process like collaborating with somebody else to tell that story? Um, Rasheen Cole is the chef at Etta, mm. uh, yes. which is a wonderful <laughs> Melbourne restaurant. Do visit. <laughs> <laughs> what was that process like, yeah. telling somebody else's story, I suppose? Yeah, we we had such a funny way of meeting that our we sometimes think are we just friends because we can collaborate together because it was such a random hospitality style night out. You know, three venues later, there's only a few people left, and we just looked at each other and went, "Hey, can we be friends?" Um, 
And I think what was so, which felt so easy about our collaborations was we started in the midst of the first lockdowns where we were both just looking for something to do whilst we were on hold with Centrelink. So we just decided, let's just throw together a recipe book. And what felt so lovely from the start is that pretty much immediately we had the same vision for things. I would suggest something and she would immediately say yes. So I'm very blessed that I've not had to have a creatively combative relationship with anyone or, you know, try and merge visions with someone that uh, I struggled to work with. But um, I think what we both shared is that we come from this sort of blend of being Australian, being Chinese. We want to honour our heritage, but we also want to you know, um, express ourselves as people who are pretty anglicised and pretty westernised. And I think that balance of where to highlight the Chinese heritage and where to, um, you know, talk very casually and be more Australian about things, we somehow just managed to find the exact same sort of thread, to the needle to thread the hole. So, yeah, it was, it was really sort of um, amazing to work with someone who you could, who pushed me to actually do the work and then I also would return it and then she would volley it back. So it was a really great experience. And Tony, you chose to tell the tale of a whole city. Oh, um, that's a very interesting one. You see, I never th thought that I was going to write about Hong Kong, put it that way, because, you know, I've got family over there and so, you know, my excuse is to, to go and visit them and so, you know, virtually sort of eat myself s stupid, you know, because, you know, as you know, some of you have, may have, have gone to Hong Kong and, you know, it's one of those really very amazing cities whereby, you know, you virtually can eat 24-7 or you can virtually sort of, you know, go and have dim sum or whatever that you want to at about five o'clock in the morning and, you know, the city just doesn't sleep. So, you know, when I was um, approached to write this book, you know, I really consider myself to be really very lucky in the sense that, you know, it just sort of combined my passion for food and it was, um, it took a couple of years to put the whole thing together but on the other hand, I think that as far as I'm concerned, I just feel that it's really very important for me, not as a Hong Kong person, but rather to give it a kind of validity which I think is really very important, you know, as far as Hong Kongers are concerned. But bearing in mind that's a very, very strong element that I keep forgetting myself. And that is Hong Kong, you know, as we, as we all know, it was really part of the whole British um, ex expansion, you know, to, to the East. So um, that's, you know, and for that reason, you know, there's a very strong British influence there, and I have to say that, you know, if you ever do get a chance to go to Hong Kong and go to one of those what I call Anglo-Sino places, you know, and you probably would eat one of the biggest um, souffles that you could you could ever 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 imagine because it's almost as big as the table. You know, I've got an imagery of that which I think is really very very fascinating. But the other th interesting for me. Uh, for me is because, like I started off by saying that I was born in Malaysia, so for me, you know, um, coming from such a mixed culture, you know, I, you know, I look Chinese, but yet at the same time, I've got Indian neighbours and I've got Malay neighbours, so that in itself has actually coloured the way that I look at food already. So, you know, when I started writing that book, you know, I really felt that it was really very important that, you know, those of you who may have had gone to Hong Kong, there is, you know, as soon as you get over to Kowloon, did you go to Kowloon? Yeah. So you I know followed that your recommendations everywhere. Oh, <laughs> and it's, and you know if that. you follow Tony's recommendations, you literally are eating 24-7. <laughs> anyway, so there, there are lots of Indians there, you know, and I find that absolutely fascinating. And not much has been written about the Indians there. So that's why I just felt that it was really very important for me to have some kind of, some kind of input because there's something like about 180,000 or 200,000 Indians there out of a population of 7 million, but yet at the same time, you know, they are so, uh, I mean, you know, they virtually sort of control certain parts of the industry, like, for instance, you know, if you go to Hong Kong, you know, um, it's, you know, you'll find that 
some person would approach you and just say, oh, Alice, I like, I like your dress, but I can make one better for you, you know. <laughs> and that, that's how it happens. And then particularly for males, you know, they'll sell suits and things like this at half the price compared to what you would pay here back home. So, you know, from that food perspective, you know, it's, it's really very interesting because if you do go to a place called Chungking Mansions, did you go to Chungking Mansion? Yeah. yeah, it's it's quite it's like a whole labyrinth of just eastern eastern smells, you know, or, or subcontinent smells, which I think is just wonderful. So, you know, based on that, that's how I started looking at food from all those various angles, and that's how Hong Kong Food City started. Does that uh, make sense? I think what you're, if you don't mind, Alice, I think, you know, what you're talking about is it's, it so goes to this idea of, like, different ways of engaging with food because you come to Hong Kong as somewhat of an outsider but you've got such a curiosity and such a great base of knowledge to draw upon. You know, for example, I've been to one of your cooking classes where you, it was mostly French food and you've got that expertise because you've got that curiosity and it's led you to learn. So I think it's something... There is something that I wrangle with about this idea of authenticity where it's about, you know... Are you allowed to talk about other people's food cultures when you come at it from a place of curiosity and engagement and learning and, of course, respect, which I think is really got to be at the heart of any of these these food conversations. But I th feel like you really have done that with the, with the Hong Kong book because there are so many different cultures and, and yeah, hi so much history to engage with. You, don't, you do it through recipes, you do it through stories, but in the beginning you do it through this really, I guess, honest engagement. Mm. So really um, what you're saying, Danny, and, and what you've managed to encapsulate in Hong Kong Food City is that if there's one genre of writing that's actually for a very long time celebrated other cultures and celebrated understanding of culture, it's, it's cookery and food. So Danny, I, I saw your wheels turning then because obviously you've just gone through the process of writing, co-writing a book with somebody from a, a different culture, but even your cookbooks, your in the mixed cookbooks, are um, celebrating chefs from all around the world and celebrating their stories. So what's your creative process like and what's this creative process been like? Because that's much more of a deep dive. Um, so the book that I've uh, helped in the writing of, it's um, called Salamati and the chef is uh, Hamed Aliari. He's got a really beautiful cafe in Sunshine also called Salamati. Um, he came to Australia from Iran as a refugee, you know, had all the, um, you know, the time on Christmas Island. He's still going through, you know, visa trauma. Um, his position in Australia is not secure. Even, even despite that, he's giving a lot to our community, um, including through this book. So the process, you know, it, it, I, I helped him write the introductions. The recipes are all his. Um, Honestly, it's his book and it's my privilege to be part of it with him. Um, but I guess, you know, whenever I'm writing or helping someone write their story or, or telling someone's story, to me it's always about, you know, do they see themselves in it? So it's not my overlay on it. It's like somehow, you know, whatever the process is or whether it's, you know, this is in his voice, so it's me sort of inhabiting his voice. Obviously, he's got approval over everything. But I think it is about... Um, just trying to stand beside somebody and see what they see, see things in the way that they see, um, try to understand, you know, let's say there's a rice dish, um, I don't know, like it's, I suppose, you know, I, just stepping away from Persian cuisine for a minute, like I think if you think about food textures, for example, and especially, you know, some of the textures in different Chinese cuisines, it, it's um, so easy to come from a Western viewpoint and say it's like it's chewy, i.e. bad or it's squishy, i.e. gross, or it's slimy, i.e. yuck. But of course there are so many other, you don't, you're imposing judgment on a, a, on a neutral quality in a food, right? It's just how it is. So I suppose um, it's a sort of roundabout sa way of saying just to stand beside uh, the person whose story it is or whose cuisine it is and to um, engage with it from their perspective. And then, you know, 
so th- so it's a book so there's no judgment in that but then if i if i flip that back to what i do as a restaurant critic again it's about expressing what it is like what my first question is always what are they trying to do are they are they succeeding on their own terms not this kind of like you know um godly overlay of um you know do i as the all-seeing all-knowing author think it is good and acceptable no i'm not trying to do that it's like um giving people enough information for them to decide whether it's something for them something that they want to try as well danny mentioned oh joanna sorry i was just going to say um that idea of letting him write from you know his personal experience perhaps um, that's what I really feel like is authentic writing when you are writing about something specific even instead of trying to you know hit four quadrants and see what's the most crossover appeal how will this you know appeal to the mass market of audience who might not have had this experience to tell something that's super specific can sometimes have more of a universal effect Um, and if I can be a bit indulgent one of my favorite quotes by Joan Didion is we tell ourselves stories in order to live And when she passed away in her 90s earlier this year, um, her obituary read, she leaves no immediate survivors because her family had tragically passed away earlier than her. And this amazing English teacher wrote in a response to this obituary saying, she wrote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live and you can't discount that. And she wrote, all storytellers leave immediate survivors. And I've always loved that line so much. And Sometimes when I think about when I'm reading, why does something, what are the things that really stick with me? Like whose story, even if I haven't been there, even if I don't, I know nothing about their circumstance, the stories that really stay are the ones where someone is writing from that personal authenticity and, you know, leaving a bit of themselves behind. Mm. Whoa. Um, <laughs> first panel, everybody. I'm ve- <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I'm a huge nerd. <laughs> Uh, I think we're all going to have to, you sh- you'll have to post that quote actually on your socials because um, we're here because we're book people. So I think everybody, that just went straight to our hearts. Tony Tan, Danny and Joanna have mentioned the A word. They've dropped the A-bomb of authentic, authenticity. Malaysia, Hong Kong, I- they're both uh, food that borrows so much should we be talking about authentic food? Can we talk about authentic food? Or do you think it's all cod's wallop, Tony Tan? Uh, why me, of all people? <laughs> like because I you said, pull no punches. I'm excited for this answer. No, no. But on the other I mean, you know, I, I, I struggle with authenticity because, I mean, you know, I've been teaching, you know, since um, lockdown was over, you know, and... I struggle with with topics because you know um, I find that fascinating because of my, my my weird background. So you know, how am I going to sort of say that anything that's authentic when I know very well that the kind of stuff that you know I am cooking at the cooking school will not be approved by my peers back in Malaysia, for instance, because they probably would turn around to say you've got the wrong fish, you've got the wrong vegetable. All that kind of stuff that makes it really very difficult for me to sort of equate what authenticity is. I mean, you know, I probably would be cooking for stuff that I've learned from either from chefs, from my mother particularly, because, I mean, she was, she was virtually the driver in the family as far as food is concerned because, you know, like um, being Chinese, you know, in a very funny sort of way, um, I mean, particularly living in, in, in Trentham, you know, when people would turn around to say that, are you enjoying yourself here in Australia? And they say, of course I do, you know. And then, uh, I mean, you know, that's, but that's the way life is. So when I go back to Malaysia, you know, and people turn around to say, that, are you having a good time in Australia? And I, of course I've got to turn around and say, of course I do. Because, you know, the way that we all cook and the way that we perceive food, Virtue sort of changes from culture to culture, people to people, family to family. So like for instance, you know, l- like uh, when I arrive in Singapore on the 2nd of June is actually a very important festival. You know, as far, you know, in Chinese it's called uh, Uye Tu'u, meaning to say it's the fifth day 
of the fifth month, whereby you know it's really very important to remember one of those generals or one of those loyalists to a particular dynasty, you know, and what and because of his his um, very strong uh, loyalty to his principles, he committed suicide by jumping into the river. So what a lot of people have done is because he was such a loyalist to the regime or to the emperor at that time, so uh, they, uh, they would throw food into the river, so therefore his body will not be eaten, but the food will be eaten by you know, sea, uh, river creatures and all that sort of thing. Based on all these various ideas, how do I go around talking about authenticity? Because, I mean, you know, all of us got very, very different perceptions about what authenticity is. I mean, like, you know, the yesterday, for instance, what I did was I just did a chicken yakitori for the cooking class, and because I've got tomatoes that's in the garden, that's virtually sort of, you know, seeing the the light of day because you know it, it's getting to the stage whereby you know I'm going to have snow this week. So what do I do with the tomatoes? You know, I've got to sort of somehow that turn those tomatoes into something that would not be representative of what those people in Malaysia or uh, or in Japan for all that for all we know, and then turning that into something that's delectable. But yet at the same time, you know, it's not authentic. But the whole question is where where does authenticity begins and where does it end? And I find that a very, very fascinating topic. So there you go. I mean, could we think about it as authentic engagement? Like whether it's with the produce, the season, the culture, the history, the place where you are, the people that you're cooking for. I mean, is that a get out clause or is that, um, is that a go reasonable <laughs> way to go <laughs> forwards? Yeah. I'll say, um, I listen to a lot of the Dave Chang podcast and he's you know, a prominent Korean chef and he says he has a lot of people that come up to him um, who are white and they say sort of sheepishly, is it okay if I make kimchi, if I make my own kimchi? And he's sort of like, I'm not the purveyor on what is you know, allowed in Korean cooking. But I think the way he approached it is that if you're coming from a place of you're really, you love it, you've, you've done the research on the history and what goes into it, and you want to honor that in your process of making it, and then he's like, go for it. And I think maybe when it comes to authenticity, now that we are so globalized, now that there's so many cultures that have merged and moved and had effects on each other, perhaps authenticity to a place and a history is no longer the bar that we measure it by. Maybe it's if it's a personal authenticity, if you come to something and you're being honest and in good faith and you want to learn, then maybe that's enough. Mm. I uh, had a lady come up to me at the Avenue Bookstore in Elstonwick after a borscht recipe ran in the Jewish News and she looked at me and she said, you're the one with the borscht. <laughs> no potatoes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she walked out of the shop without buying a copy of In Praise of Veg. <laughs> And the best expression that I've heard around that notion of authenticity is the get out clause is that it's authentic to you, to your family, to your experience. And admittedly, my mum also said, why didn't you put potato in your bush? You know, but it's because I was thinking speed, you know, I was, it was about fit for purpose, right? So what did I set out to do? I set out to do a fast bush. Unfortunately, yeah, the purists, not fans. Danny Vallant, I want to talk about something that you mentioned earlier on about digital v traditional because who's allowed to write about food doesn't just mean who's write, allowed to write recipes. It also can extend to who's allowed to critique food. How do you think the digital space has changed that idea of food criticism, restaurant criticism? Oh, well, I guess it's given a lot more people voices, which is fantastic. It's put a lot more information out into the ether, so there are a lot more resources to draw on. Of course, you know, then if you're using those resources, you've got to work out, you know, how reliable they are or, you know, what are they based on or is there an angle, um, is there an angle to them? So there's a lot less, I guess, mediation and, and um, editing, which I think for the most part is probably positive, but of course can be... Uh, yeah, can have its pitfalls. 
um, I don't know. Like, it's so interesting as a restaurant critic. You know, I've, there's it's it's um, you know, we, there, sh there can be a whole other panel on the role of restaurant criticism in you know the current um, media landscape. I think it's there's so much to talk about in about in that. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, to me, it's all about um, it's all about backing up what, backing up opinion with knowledge and context. So, I mean, my review today in the Sunday Age is about an Indonesian rendang place, and the Indonesian rendang is not the same as the Malaysian rendang or the Singaporean rendang. So, there's um, it's much darker, it's much drier. So this rendang specialist has, um, you know, from West Sumatra has people come in from Malaysia who are, you know, desperate for some great rendang. And they're like, this is like, this is, I think you cooked it too long. He's like, no, 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 <laughs> this is how we, this is how we do it in West Sumatra. So I think you can get, you can get so specific about cuisine and that is a joy of eating in Melbourne. Like how lucky am I to be, are we all really, we can all go there, it's just by Campbell Junction, uh, to go and eat some very specific West Sumatran rendang and learn, think, you know, think, engage with this whole idea of, you know, the different patterns of migration. Um, yeah, uh, all the stories that come out of that. Um, so, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just an, it's, it's endlessly interesting and it gives endless opportunities for engagement. And the reason I love writing about food is for that, is because I know I'll learn, you know, at least one new thing every day and it gives me the opportunity to speak to people who are passionate about, about what they do and about, about their stories, about their individual stories. Joanna, you've been on the receiving end of that, being front of house at a few key restaurants. What was that experience like on the flip side, um, that there must have been moments where the whole kitchen and the whole the whole restaurant had experienced someone writing about their food, your food. Yeah, definitely. Um, usually very stressful. Uh, someone clocks it very early and then that's, um, you know, it sort of sets a particular tone. And I think that does come from the more traditional side of, you know, food critics that are all recognised, that have photos, that everyone knows and um, you know the traditional media outlets and things like that but I guess that with the rise of the internet you do have everyone else becoming a food critic as well so in a way you can't just focus in on the people that you recognize from publications that you know anymore because anyone you have no idea what their following is you have no idea what they could potentially write and in a way that is also democratizing because as it should be, everyone should be getting the most amazing experience when they come and dine. It, you know, we say there shouldn't be, you know, people who are given different treatment, but obviously sometimes there are. But I think the fact that it has made some food critics anonymous and um, perhaps given ordinary people who just love to eat a voice um, is perhaps a good thing and that it keeps the restaurant a bit more on their toes, I guess. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've worked in restaurants, so... If it's all changed now and I'm saying terrible things, then please ignore me. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's changed. But what Danny um, perhaps is alluding to as well is that now um, perhaps isn't the time to be writing scathing reviews of restaurants that are desperately trying to find staff and trying to stay open. Now, we have got some time for questions uh, from the audience, from you. And I'm conscious that we've only got about 12 minutes to do so. So speak now or forever hold your peace. There we go, a question. Um, have you got a microphone or do I need to... No, there's no... The voles don't have a mic. That's cool. Maybe just yell it out just, and I'll repeat it. So how has the rise of dietaries changed um, the notion of authentic cookery? Well, I mean, I think it's, it is really interesting. I suppose it's another, uh, it's another version of versions of recipes, isn't it? So sometimes, I think, to me, food is all about finding ways to bring people in. Recipes are certainly that. It's like you're giving recipes that... Uh, open a dish up for somebody, open up an ingredient. And you, I mean, Alice, you do that so well and in Praise of Veg, where it's just like, unlock, unlock a vegetable for me. Um, and I suppose if, you know, if I think about, 
uh, yeah, I mean, I think about mapo tofu. So, like a, a tofu dish that's um, traditionally made with um, with pork. Um, and then you think about doing that with mushrooms, for example, instead, and just think, well, you probably can get to, you know, a similar sort of, um, I guess, you know, flavour balance, um, a similar probably sort of mouthfeel and sense of s satisfaction. Um, it's going to be a little bit more kosher uh, <laughs> <laughs> as well as vegetarian. So, I don't know. For me, I think it's good because it unlocks and opens up recipes and flavour experiences for more people. Um, yeah, so I'm all for it. I think if, if food is supposed to be about bringing people in, welcoming people to the table and unlocking um, experience and culture, then I think, yeah, let's just do it. Very true. Uh, saying um, a lot of the food we eat is, you know, sort of the history of humankind and why we eat certain foods is because of the need or whatever was available or things like that. So the fact that now these old recipes are perhaps all being adapted to be meat free um, is going to go down in history as the time when we as a human race had so much meat in abundance, but it be not became about taste, it became about resources and um, environmentalism. And, you know, in 100 years, they're going to say that's why all those recipes became vegetarian. And uh, it was due to the society. So I think it's sort of just an inevitable part of the continuation of humanity. <laughs> And it's not the first time that these kind of meat replacements, you know, um, I hosted a, the Alternative Proteins Conference just last week and, um, you know, we talk about plant-based meats, cell-based meats, precision fermentation, but think about tofu, seitan, tempeh, there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, veggio-friendly, vegan-friendly dishes that Tony Tan can talk about. That's going back a long time. <laughs> Um, and I, I, well, put it this way, I'm vegetarian a lot of the time at home, not, not for any particular reason whatsoever, but it's just that I happen to love eating vegetables. And, you know, this is a plug for her because I just tend to think that her book is absolutely spectacular. So I've, I've got to cherry pick most of the time some of the books, uh, some of the recipes that you have. But I also have to say that, you know, um, we like like what Joanna says. You know, we are at a time when you know vegetarianism seems to be really very very much the in thing to talk about and so on. But you know, I I make my own seitan. I make my I don't make my own tempeh because I I still have yet to find out where am I going to incubate you know the the um, soybeans. So therefore, I'd be able to sort of make sure that you know the the rice the the rice yeast that. I've fortunately found, but yet at the same time, I just don't really quite know how am I going to get it quite right, because if I get it wrong, you know, for all you know, that if anybody who comes to me and, and I feed them with that, they probably would be, you know, they become vegetarians themselves in the ground, put it that way. <laughs> so that's that's not a very, very good <laughs> idea whatsoever. But I mean, you know, it, it I, li like when we were all sort of, the, the whole panel was talking about tofu and all that sort of thing, you know, I actually made um, uh, a vegetarian uh, mapo tofu, except that um, it. I, what I did was I just used um, black beans, fermented black beans, and it actually gave it that very, very distinctive flavor all the way through. Mm -hmm. And because I'm living out in a bush, so to say, trying to be not really that far away, um, um, I managed to get a hold of some of the pine mushrooms. So I was really very lucky, yeah, from oh. that perspective. So I did pine mushroom, mapo tofu. Wow, there you go. Yes. Um, I want to leave time for more questions, but can I just briefly disagree with myself on one thing? Um, which is that I don't like it when recipes are adapted to be like too, 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 too healthy. And I kind of feel like if you want to make a cake that's like sugar-free and fat-free and all the rest free, I just think, I don't know, maybe just like eat a mandarin. <laughs> 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 Mic drop moment. It reminds me too, you know, uh, it's the it's Melbourne Jewish Book Week. Um, I, I don't know if some of you know what the, uh, you know, talk about authentic. So uh, some of these uh, plant-based proteins are designed to be like pork. And I know that some people um, are trying to figure out if 
that is still kosher or if it's problematic, you know, being a cloven hoofed plant-based alternative. So there's like rabbis trying to work out if it's still kosher, if it's fake pork. <laughs> yes, your question. Um, could you please, re I've, I've got a vegan granddaughter and I'm now in traditional Jewish chicken soup uh, doesn't go the distance. Can you recommend a good vegan cookbook <laughs> writer? Yeah. <laughs> Have you got a broth broth scene in praise of veg, oh, Alice? I've got broth. Can you stop plugging my book, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the facilitator. Um, so I'm thinking as far. Thank you. Thank you for the. Um, uh, so yeah, things like umami rich ingredients um, for your vegetable broth. Um, shiitake mushrooms, tomatoes, um, even a bit of tomato paste, but it's the schmaltziness and unfortunately you're just not going to get good schmaltziness mm. in an oil. What do you think, Tony Tan? Can you make something schmaltzy with plants? I think that's going to be a very hard call, to be quite honest. Yeah. But I mean, all of us here in this room are really very interested about food. We are really very interested about, you know, whatever, what whatever the terminology mean as far as authenticity is concerned. But uh, I just tend to think that, you know, I'm sure with about 40 or 60 of us here in this room, we'll come up with something that's schmaltzy. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I went to um, a restaurant on Friday night in Fitzroy called Rizzo. It's vegetarian. And they serve an autumn broth. And basically it's... It's um, all the trimmings from the other vegetables and it had the most extraordinary depth of flavour and roundness. In, um, so in it was five different types of pumpkin, uh, some tr mushroom trimmings, so they had pine mushrooms, so it was the trimmings of the pine mushrooms and like s herb stalks and just all the other um, bits and pieces. And it was so deliciously rounded and warming. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of it's about just building layers of flavour with different vegetables. And I, I think perhaps, you know, so often when we're trying to do a version of something, it's like we do aim for this sort of rep replication. But maybe it's about, like, thinking about what are the qualities of the chicken soup that I love. And it's, I suppose it is, it's that comforting, it's that layer of flavour, it's the fact that it's been cooked for a long time, it's had all the love put into it. So maybe you can get the same amount of love into it, but just not the same amount of chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and make it a brown stock too, you know, maybe roast the vegetables because when you roast pumpkin and sweet potato, it can, with lots of oil, mm. what happens at the bottom is you get you do get kind of like a veggio schmaltz. Mm. Nice. So we workshopped it for you. But there are some wonderful, wonderful plant-based books coming out um, and there's even now, you know, even just seeing the section grow in bookshops for vegetarian, vegan books. And don't just look in that section because some books are surprisingly very useful in terms of substitutions and things. And ask her, who's, sh who's she cooking from? She'll love that Bubba's asking that question in the first place. Yes. Oh, hello, how are you? <laughs> What's your best broth, vegan oh, broth? Like what you said, shiitake mushrooms, concrete, it's hard to get, but even if you um, that would be a broth base, shiitake mushrooms, and then chicken mushrooms, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and then make it all still equally as delicious without any kind of animal protein is a really exciting place. And I think more and more people are moving that way, but it's just kind of um, you need to hook them in because if you say to them, you know, here's this seaweed mushroom which they only know as right exactly mushroom which they only know is that slimy thing that their mum tried to feed them and whatever so it's kind of yeah i think it's again fit for purpose and also know your audience Very true. yeah in the middle there in the middle Um, <laughs> I think one one thing is to make f make the food out of better ingredients, like better base ingredients. I think it just makes me think of um, of Zelda, a, a kosher sourdough baker that's in Rip and Lee, and you know she's there was there's not a great recent tradition of sourdough baking in the Melbourne Jewish community, um, the kosher community. She had a real hard sell with with some of her um, orthodox friends and, and community members to get, not only to get them to pay like seven or eight dollars for a loaf of bread but to remind them because it's you know of the um the healthful properties of sourdough or of you know great flour um and you know a lot of the older people they were like oh my goodness is you know this is reminds me of old vienna or whatever it was it was you know i haven't had such good rye bread for decades um but i think part of it is um about i guess as the as ingredient quality in general in Australia has improved so much in the last decades, I think some of the, um, you know, the sort of enclaves, the kosher enclaves, I think perhaps there hasn't been that same um, focus on finding the very best quality ingredients. So I kind of feel like there's something in that where it's, you know, um, you know, if it's bread, it's like using great quality flour. It's like a natural, naturally risen breads. Um, perhaps if it's gefilte fish, maybe is it about finding like really fantastic local fish? Um, I don't know. Is it? Is there something in in that? That's what I wonder. And there is a, there is a sleeper kind of um, on social media. They, there are a lot of people that are starting to celebrate it. You know, Jewish. The cookbook by Jake Cohen, that's that's been hugely popular and, you know, he bakes colour with celebrities every Friday night. So, you know, Ashkenazi food is having a moment. It's, you know. <laughs> what is the gefilteria? Thank you, Alyssa Goldstein. Um, now, I, we, could do, we could talk about this for hours, clearly, you know, but Danny Vallant has a Carlton Collingwood game to go to and you have more panels to go to. Uh, so I think now is the time to say again how grateful we are to have shared a moment with you all, but especially how grateful we are to have shared the moment with Tony Tan, Joanna Hu and Danny Vallant. <laughs> Thank you for supporting Melbourne Jewish Book Week and look forward to seeing you in 2023.